Mohandas Gandhi meets with Muhammad Ali Jinnah in an attempt to bring the Hindus and the Muslims together. In an India always torn by the strife of castes, Mahatma Gandhi has tried for some semblance of unity. Again, it is something he failed to achieve. He parted friends with Jinnah, he says, but the Indian problem remains. This document, some people say it's forged, some people um, suggest that it's the Pakistani ISI, and of course everybody says it's the CIA. But this document that seems to have been signed by Gandhi, Jinnah, and Radcliffe, yeah. Suggesting that next year the border between um, the border between India and Pakistan should be substantially moved. Well, I do not know how far that is true. But Jinnah, when he went from Pakistan, he called me and said that my house is in London. Mm -hmm. Please look after me. And once I retired from this government chairman's position, though he was then clearly aware that he was. Passing out because he had been very advanced in the American council. He said that I'll come back to Bombay and stay here. And Gandhi never accepted the partition proposal. But the point is this that, uh, and so I would not be surprised that both Gandhi and uh, Jin, both of them passed out within one year of the partition, mm -hmm. believed that the partition would not be sustained. And none of them are too deeply committed to the idea of the partition. I mean, it's crazy. This map? This map is totally fucking crazy. This map is totally fucking crazy. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. In part because there are a few reasons. I think my major problem with the map and the document is that, like, I don't know what, you know, they were passing, passing the shisha when they were having this meeting, but the way in which, am I, am I allowed to say these things? Yeah. <laughs> or, or the sharab was flowing, but um, the way in which they draw these lines don't make any sense to me at all. So when we get news um, about a possible new map for the partition of India, and you hear that as a girl from, the, from Queens, what does that mean to you? Nothing personal. What it means to me is I'm just another student who's hearing about a country's history. It's the grandmother country for me. There's no personal tie to it. I don't have relatives living there. But at the same time, there is that curiosity that keeps nipping at me in the back of my mind because I know my heritage lies there. Okay, I... Uh... I read this recent issue of Chimuranga in which there is a certain Dr. John Soski uh, who has hinted at this map which supposedly Gandhi and Jinnah arrived at an agreement about the future delineation of the borders of India. I'm not sure uh, what to do with this because John then, or this John Soski then goes on to interview somebody called Hamid Parsani who is described as an elusive mercurial Iranian archaeologist. Now, what the connection between Iran and Pakistan and India? Now, all of this sounds very fantastic to me. I'm a historian. I have a certain kind of investment in fact and the truth, and I'm from India. So I thought maybe, I don't know if this Dr. John Sosky exists, or even Hamid Parsani exists, or even this map exists. But there are certain things that I do know from my research, and I believe in research. Right? Research is crucial in all of this. So this, what I'll do here is I'll read. I'm a careful guy. I don't like extempor extemporizing. And I don't like uh, you know, this thing about sovereignty, theology, patriarchy. I'm afraid I have no time for all of these kinds of jargon. We, we don't, shouldn't mislead people. That's, that shouldn't be the object of history. So, what I want to present before you is something that's a result of my research. Now, I've been doing research for 20 years, in teaching Indian history for more. So, I think what I have to say is interesting, important, and unknown. And I think John Sosky, if he exists, and this map, if it exists, it's, it's drawing upon something that is, probably has a grain of truth in it.
I am a sulphur-crested cockatoo. Though I'm still a baby, I have a long memory. I am from Woolloomooloo. The screeching of my mothers and aunts as they swoop over Sydney red gums and golden and silver wattle trees hurts my ears. This is one of the most beautiful cities I have been in, but I remember enjoying my time in other places. I was once an exotic parrot in Montparnasse. I escaped by flying out of the window. The fussy French woman who owned me was most upset. She kept me locked up and the wood wooden shutters closed after I was returned. My name as a macaw was custard and my home was a 17th century manor house in the hamlet of Harberton Ford. The family was very rich. The grandmother had been an, an American heiress. They raised sheep and kept chickens. I had the run of the farmyard and vegetable patch where I was allowed to tease the curmudgeonly rooster. I liked being a robin in the garden of the retired art professor in Bovey Tracy. His wife was keen on growing fruits and flowers. She had the most delicious gooseberry bushes. I was never hungry then. Both those lives were in the English county of Devon. I also recall fondly the sooty smoggy time in London. I miss the crowded chattering of my fellow sparrows among the blackened chimney pots. I was a pigeon in the Toronto suburbs of Mimico and Etobicoke, where I laid my eggs on the balconies of the high-rise apartment buildings. I liked racing the Queen Street car. I have been a giant yellowish owl sleeping undisturbed and peacefully by day in the abandoned and crumbling brick houses in a Punjabi village. The owners had deserted their small ancestral towns to live abroad in Britain, Canada and Australia. My favourite tree from my reincarnations is the white magnolia growing in the Giardini in Venice. I loved it when it was full of heady, perfumed chirping at dawn and dusk. This is the BBC Home Service. Power and the State. Lord Radcliffe, in the fifth of his Wreath Lectures, talks about the British rule in India up to the time of the mutiny. Lord Radcliffe. The British have formed the habit of praising their institutions, which are sometimes inept, and of ignoring the character of their race, which is often superb. In the end, they will be in danger of losing their character and being left with their institutions, a result disastrous indeed. I am moved to say this when I consider the strange story of the British Empire in India, an administrative achievement which was unique of its kind, which had every argument against its success except the personal quality of those who took part in it, and of which the names of the original founders are virtually forgotten. Tonight I will recall a few of those names. For one reason, because the connoisseur of human character will find in them collector's pieces and for another, because the whole adventure deserves its chapter in the anatomy of power. It represents an episode that has been finally closed. And it may well stand, I think, as a classic example of how men really respond to the stimulus of great authority. Oh, well, I mean, Radcliffe doing it makes the most sense of all because he just knew nothing at all. It doesn't make sense at all for me to look at a map like this and think about UP being cut in half or Bihar being cut in half. These are just divides that are both so ahistorical um, and so ridiculous that it just seems like an arbitrary, cruel joke that these leaders played, you know, on the future. And I guess the thing that really, that really bothers me is why they thought that imposing a new border was better than removing a border. I think it would have been a really sort of, you know, like a, a wonderful surprise to find this document that, that removes the borders and makes Pakistan and India and, you know, East Bengal and West Bengal, sorry, East Bengal and, and um, you know, East Bengal and India back into, into one entity. I think that's the kind of surprise I would, I would anticipate and expect more from those kinds of leaders than the imposition of an arbitrary border. The uh, more displaced you are from economic um, stability, the more connection you have to the motherland yeah. and because that gives you a sense of stability and so hearing about the partition makes even more um, 
there's more waves of um, disturbance right. among those who have even less um, economic stability, political stability in their kind of second party, third party countries. Right. Um, for me, when I hear about it, like you, I hear about, I'm hearing, oh, this colossal disaster yeah. that created enormous injustices. Right. And even if it's a relationship between two friends or between a professor and a student, as we have, we know that there's a power difference between us, right. but it does not have to be a power imbalance, right. though power right. is different. And right. though there is a boundary of respect between us, as long as we mind it, the border itself doesn't necessarily create um, unethical behavior as much right. as it helps us kind of mind each other's ethical right. behaviors, right? right? So in a way, I think borders themselves don't construct um, disasters and injustice, but it's about how both of us behave with right. respect to the border right. and who decided what the border means now. Right. So if I'm the only person, um, the person with the greater power in the relationship deciding where the border goes, how much I get to have because of right. where the border was placed and you have no say in it whatsoever, um, 40, 50, 60, 100 years later, us redrawing that border doesn't really reconstitute the right. injustices un right. done. It doesn't undo those yeah. injustices. Right? Those institutions of power have already been solidified for those decades. In the gloaming, across a foggy terrain, he saw all manner of other boats. Feluca, Dow, Coracle, Paddle Steamer, Ketch, Cutter, Sloop, Longship, Norfolk Trading Wherry, and even a Quinquiran and more. The vessels glided along satiny ribbons of water, converging at the river of oblivion before sailing toward the Akashic Library. Disincarnate he could, however, feel by touch the splintered wood of his weathered and off-repainted dory. Through its glass bottom he looked at things he would miss, the deep grass-green velvety moss that grew on damp tree trunks and in between the cobblestones, the smell of the heavy dewy pink roses unfurling outside the cottage window, the pleached laburnum alley and Against much of this, for all its excellence, stands the figure of Henry Lawrence. Indeed, his quarrel with his brother John over the policy of administration in the new province of the Punjab dramatizes the conflict between the old school and the new. Henry lost when Dalhousie the Viceroy supported John and sent Henry into retirement as agent in Rajputana. But he took with him the passionate admiration of such iron men as his own subordinates, John Nicholson and Herbert Edwards more than that, the grief and the devotion of his Indian subjects. It was a long, living funeral procession from Lahore nearly to Amritsar, someone who saw it, said of his departure. In truth, it was a conflict of attitude as much as of policy. Henry, imaginative and perceptive, couldn't envisage power under John's simple categories. He thought that it was our duty to restore and govern through the Sikh chieftains as a native aristocracy and that there was no future in India for a government that reserved all high authority and emolument for itself and reduced all below it to a common level. A man of profound compassion, and like so many of his contemporaries, a fervent Christian, he drew away from their vigorous certainties. To him, power without imagination was itself an evil. It's the due admixture of romance and reality that best carries a man through life, he once said. Henry Lawrence's picture is worth looking at, for he was among the noblest of all the rich material that went from this country to the service of India. You see the fine forehead and the great brooding eyes, the drawn and patient face. He was only 51 when he died at Lucknow, but he looks an aging man. If you're not sort of at the border, if you're not going to be affected by this new board change, if you're sitting in Bangalore, does this kind of change actually mean much to you? Yeah. I wonder if it does or doesn't. So are we talking also about, do we need to talk about the way in which um, 
you know, we we need to class the Indian nation especially. Yeah. I think the story is different in Pakistan where politics are much more um, lived in a, in a lived violently and urgently, especially in Pakistani cities in a, in a more day-to-day -day way, but, you know, if you're sitting, um, you know, in your Bombay apartment working for your call center job, basically being on a Western schedule, does it really matter that, you know, a city 200 miles to the north is going to be included in a new land ent entity, or does not matter what your entity is called at all? So, I wonder if, you know, the emergence of the middle class, the rise of global capitalism in India, the failure of Nehru's, you know, initial vision to protect the Indian economy, you know, that we see sort of unfold from the 1990s, does that have to color the way in which we think about the importance of borders? I think the trauma of partition is failing. I don't think that the partition is a big issue. What is from 1990s onwards is being focused and which captured the imagination of many uh, Indian, uh, in the Indian you, apart from, some are not bothered in South India, but uh, is the idea of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And that Pakistan sponsors terrorism, and Pakistan sponsors violence, uh, conflicts, etc. But there is no you know, concept of, uh, no, no interest in what happened in 1947. The new generation is not simply interest so let's get down to facts so I've always felt at the level of a suspicion an inkling a creeping sense of history which is not yet passed that there is such a map that this map is true it does exist whatever else may not exist. And it takes me back to the recent insinuation of a correspondence, brief but lapidary, between Fernand Brudel, the famous French historian, writing from a prisoner of war camp in Lübeck in 1940 to Gandhi. Now Brudel is struggling with the anthropocentrism of the Annals school to which he belongs, and he's drawn inexorably but resisting towards Gandhi's rejection of history. You might well ask why, I don't have the answer to that. And he asked Gandhi a gentle question about the relation between nature and sovereignty. And Gandhi writes to him with some candid asides about Romain Roland, who you all know went on to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, richly undeserved. And this, these asides have been suppressed by the estate of that great sentimentalist Roland. And all that Gandhi says is one word, water. Brudel persists in the second letter, now addressing Gandhi no longer as Mahatma, but as Maestro, and asks, So, do you mean, and I'm quoting here, So, do you mean the fluvial as that which stands outside history and asserts its own sovereignty? Gandhi again persists nomically and teasingly. He says, Water is God. I'm not clear what he means by this, but Gandhi was prone to say that most things were God. So I presume that there's an interesting epistemological point that's being posed here. The next letter from Brudel, of which only a fragment survives, I have it here, but I don't think I really need to put it forward as evidence. This is, after all, a brief interview. The next letter from Brudel, of which only a fragment survives, the silverfish at Vartha having been persistent, says from what I can piece together that fluvial and alluvial together make up the twin poles of a history beyond history. Then Gandhi raises the issue of water with Jinnah in October 1946 in a mischievous retort to the latter's grandiloquent remark that he would have Pakistan even if it were the size of a handkerchief. Much water will flow from this remark, Jinnah Sahib, Gandhi said. Jinnah snapped, yes, water flows, borders are futile, Nehru resists this and Patel dreams of royalty falling at his feet. It's a peasant's perversion of the order of things. And suddenly, they both seem to have seen it, a new map that stood outside of history, outside of the modern, and corresponding to a secular theology of space. I'm afraid I must uh, use some jargon here, just to, if only to match this fictional John Sosky, Hamid Parsani dialogue. The five rivers on one side, like digits from a wrist, 
and the chaos of reticulate waters across the peninsula, the five rivers being the rivers of the Punjab. One cannot map water, said Gandhi, and Mahadev, a scribe, writing faithfully in his yellowing notebook, Mahadev Desai, records Jinnah's jibe, an MK, it took you this long, did it? And striding to the bookshelf, he brings out a loose sheaf of papers covered in crabbed handwriting, soil clinging to the edges, which I presume he was referring to the notes that Brodel made in Lübeck. And he asked, do you know of this man, Fernand? And it's almost like a moment of epiphany because Mahadev writes that Gandhi and Jinnah embraced, Jinnah somewhat awkwardly, Jinnah didn't like to embrace people or ideas, well ideas, one idea he did embrace. And on the back of a note from Rajagur Palachari, who was also crucial to the transfer of power, draws a map, no borders, no Pakistan, no India, just water. Rivers that embraced the Hindu Kush, the Himalayas, the Aravalis, Vindhya and Satpura, the Sahyadris coursing and corroding the attachments of borders. The map, wrote Mahadev, looked like a hand over the geography of the subcontinent, a hand with its digits and reticulated veins, a hand from the past raised in blessing. This may have been Mahadev's sentimentality, but it was a hand, nevertheless, summoning up water to redress the tyranny of land. And I'll stop here. Linnets, larks and finches, we are but a figment of a writer's imagination, residing in a room where, when the fog lifts, we see Lincoln's in fields through the grimy panes of our window. A flower seller hawks her violets by the park palings. She is Mary Ann, a Shropshire lass and draper's daughter. Soon to shelter in homes for distressed seamstresses and fallen women. Between prayers and laundry she'll eat well until the bloom is back and sail away to marry a farmer in a small Ontario township. Here I must leave what I had begun to say about those of our countrymen who founded and built up the British administration of India. Much was to come after. The mutiny, the long years that followed, which seemed to look neither back to the past nor forward to a future. And then the efforts to end honourably what these men had honourably begun. I don't touch on this, which is outside my picture. Even with the men I've spoken of, I've failed to give any proper taste of their quality or of what they did. It's too diffuse a subject. Nor do these incurious islands care greatly for what is done in their name and beyond their sight. These doings will be remembered in a few families. The families which, as Kipling said, served India generation after generation as dolphins follow in line across the open sea. Plowdens, Trevors, Beatons, Rivet Carnacks, and I could add a dozen more. But the wind has blown, the hot wind of the Indian plains and the dust has already drifted over the memory of their achievement. But it may be some service to think of them at those times when one falls to wondering whether those who are given power must always use it for selfish ends or forget its purpose in the pride of its possession. When one asks whether there must always be a governing class to whom power is to be entrusted, it may help to recall the origins and training of these men. What was their secret? Pride of race, sense of duty, sound schooling, all those things were present. And yet the quality that strikes one most is a certain unaffected readiness to be themselves. Goethe noted it in our countrymen. It lies, he said, in the courage they have to be that which nature made them. Okay, so could you clarify what you're making an argument that Jinnah and, and Gandhi agreed to a different map that was based on the sovereignty of bodies, sovereignty over bodies of water? 
Yes, I mean, it's a typical question. This is the kind of question I have great impatience for. You know, people who believe in something called the nation state, people who believe in borders. And after all, I mean, we must realize that Gandhi was something more than what he's presented as, and so was Jinnah. They were both extremely well read. Jinnah had read Brudel, I mean, which is a surprising thing for a politician. Not many people read Brudel these days, I mean, let alone politicians. And both of them felt that water was significant and not land. And, of course, metaphorically this is interesting, because India's independence is premised on tears on both sides of the border. And so I think the question that you're asking here is that, and I noticed the deep note of skepticism in your voice, I, mean, I think neither of them believed in borders, because Jinnah wanted Pakistan to be anywhere. Right? He would have been quite happy had Pakistan, as he said, the size of a handkerchief, and it could have been anywhere. It would, needn't have been on the territory where it was. And Gandhi, of course, didn't believe in any territory other than the kingdom of God. And so, therefore, this idea of water, which has, I think, been mischievously and politically buried, because we do not want to share waters. We might want to share a history, but we don't want to share waters. I think we, the other thing I always think about is that as diasporic people, there's not one response to such news. Yeah. Um, the diaspora is so diverse economically, class-wise, we still have often, even if it's three generations removed, we have memory of the village and the ethnic right. group, right? right? The religions to which we right. once belonged to, even if we've sort of migrated to new religions. Right. Um, we have those sort of... Um, alignments and, and allegiances still intact. Right, I think absolutely. Stuff. Whenever my family watches the news and they see, I mean, political disputes between like Pakistan and India or like the dispute over Kashmir, yeah. there's, they have no family that's, you know, being directly influenced by it. So all they can say is, this is just colonial violence and it's the same violence that affected their homeland. So that's yeah. one sort of connection, really? yeah. the connection between, I guess the biggest connection between India and Guyana for my family was the legacy of British imperialism. There's a huge dividend for this. A massive amount of money could be saved in channel movement and can be invested into social infrastructure. And that's why I think it, it would be really interesting to think about the way in which um, you know, a South Asian identity might be the possibility that Jinnah and Gandhi and, and I, don't, I don't think Radcliffe cared all about that, um, you know, expected or, or, or wanted to sort of elicit. Um, but it would be interesting to think about the ways in which South Asians actually connect to each other through, um, through more informal behaviors, through um, their, their spending. You know, the Andamans is becoming not like a site of vacation only for you know, for Westerners, but like, but for, for rich Indians as well. Okay. Um, thinking about, you know, Goa is really sort of an international entity, right? That yeah. Indians buy into as a tourist destination. Like, there are other ways in which South Asian-ness can um, emerge here, both in terms of what's legitimately considered sort of, you know, wh who is legitimately considered sort of buying into the idea of the nation state still, and which populations are kind of seen as being okay as outside of it. Map premised on water and not on land, which stands history on its head, and it brings in the fluidity of a cosmology, it brings in the fluidity of a notion of God, and a fluidity that transcends the divide between Hindu and Muslim. And I think we need to take this seriously. The first one is that the basically the population decide in their side of the country. Yeah. They don't want any uh, confrontation. They are all peace-loving people, particularly the middle class families. They really love each other. We have seen people coming this side, coming, going their side. You know, whenever an Indian goes to Pakistan, they are really loved. In fact, particularly if you ask me about us, we have a family living there who are our relations. They come to our wedding, we go to their wedding. So this is all created by these bloody self-seeking politicians and, of course, the army. 
the Pakistani army. Indian army doesn't play any role because they are subservient to the political masters. In India, we believe in democracy, so does the army. Now, I served in the army. We never thought of uh, disobeying the orders of uh, our immediate superiors, but to talk of the politicians who really matter. But politicians all over, this side, that side, they are the same. They only want to cook their own food. That is the unfortunate part. But ultimately, the prophecy is like if German, East and West German can be together, why not India and Pakistan? We mm -hmm. have been living for centuries. Centuries mm -hmm. are together. We have the same customs, same culture. I mean, why not uh, to reunite? Why not? 